if you look at Sulawesi, uh, sort of in the middle to the right there, just to the left of Papua New Guinea, at the upper part of Sulawesi is a place called Lembe Strait. It's a famous place for divers. It's often called muck diving, but you are on dark volcanic sand and a wonderful array of critters, including cephalopods. So several of the videos I'll share with you this morning were, were shot there in Lembe Strait. Roger and I both visited there several years ago, would love to go back. So there's another map of, of Sulawesi. If you look at Monado up at the top, uh, Lembe Strait is just to the east, just to the right of Monado up there. And let's start out talking about color and pattern. Most predators that we are familiar with have color vision. And it's kind of remarkable that the cephalopods do not have the cones in their retinas and the retinal pigments that would normally allow for color vision. On the other hand, they are able to match the color and intensity and pattern of their backgrounds exactly. So how the heck do they do that? Well, one theory was that they use the grayscale and that every different color has a value in the grayscale. And Roger Hanlon and his colleagues have pretty well disproved that one. But there is another possibility called chromatic aberration. When you have a lens or a crystal, very often around the edge, the white light gets broken down into the colors of the rainbow. It's called chromatic aberration. And there is a father-son team at UC Berkeley uh, who have shown that these animals might well be using chromatic aberration. Uh, I have their names here somewhere, and now I've lost it, but struck or something like that. Anyway, uh, when you start talking about color uh, and color vision, remember there are two big components to that. There's the object that's being looked at, uh, the source, if you will, and then there is the viewer. And a lot can happen between the source and the viewer. Uh, what the, the visual equipment, let's call it a retina, for instance, in the cephalopods, uh, picks up is just the beginning of the process. And then that information is sent to the brain. And a lot of the final perception of what the animal is seeing uh, is resolved in the brain. And it turns out cephalopods have the largest brains compared to body mass of any group of invertebrates. Their brains are very different from ours. Being mollusks, for instance, the gut runs right through the middle of the brain, which does not happen in any other group of animals. Uh, but since their evolutionary past is rooted back in snail-like critters uh, hundreds of million years ago, they still retain that element in the way their nervous system is put together. Uh, they have a pair of optic lobes, the cephalopods do, that are outsized because vision is a very important part of what they're doing. And probably 30 to 40% of what we would call brain activity is actually going on in smaller brain-like structures at the base of each of the arms. So the, the brain, if you will, is somewhat dispersed throughout the body. And to make things even more complex, they have light sensitive cells in the skin that have opsins, visual pigments in them. And there may even be components of their being able to resolve color that are coming from the skin itself. There's a lot of research going on in all this, and it's quite mysterious. Uh, 
you're looking at an octopus that is not showing much pigment. Then let me say just a little bit about how the chromatophores work. A chromatophore is where the color is. And a chromatophore is not a cell. It's a tiny little organ made up of a pigment layer. Underlying that is a reflected layer called an iridophore. And under that is a basal white layer called a leucophore. And all of those combined make up the chromatophore. So it is a tiny little organ. And we're talking millions of these things uh, in the eyes of these animals. Uh, we don't do very well in looking at shades of gray. We see somewhere between 30 and, si 30 and 16 shades of gray. Uh, the cephalopods do much, much better. They can probably see in the neighborhood of 200 shades of gray. So that gives them a lot of information. They can also see polarized light, which it turns out can be very important in, in both communication and in resolving prey in their visual field. Uh, they don't have any cones. In the human eye, we have 120 million rods for black and white vision and 7 million cones. Cats have eight times more rods than we have. And that helps them see at night under very, very low light conditions. Okay. Well, I talked about chromatophores and how they are used in uh, regulating the color and pattern and intensity in the skin of these animals. A, a typical octopus has about 25 million chromatophores uh, in the skin. Uh, all right, well, that's enough facts and figures. Let's see a few of the results of all this. So we just moved from an octopus where you're mostly we're seeing the basal white layer to another one that is basic black or dark brown. This is a lembe straight shot. That's volcanic sand behind this octopus. Uh, and I was just going to say something and I've lost it. So I guess I'll say something else. Um, these animals can change their color and pattern almost instantaneously. It's literally the blink of an eye. And you'll see that in some of the videos I'm going to show you. At the aquarium, we have a little sand dab exhibit. And half of it is little sand dabs on dark sand. And the other half is sand dabs on light sand. And in each case, the animals are camouflaged. They're adapted to either the dark or the light. If we were to remove the barrier and let them intermix and swim from dark to light and vice versa, the aquarists tell me it might take them as much as six or seven hours to make the adjustment from dark to light. The cephalopods do that in seven tenths of a second, literally the blink of an eye. And it is critical to these very vulnerable, soft-bodied animals to be able to do this. When an octopus, for instance, that does two foraging uh, episodes each day to go out and feed, uh, they may undergo 100 camouflage events during that one foray of a few minutes to an hour or so. And so they're using this rapid change ability very, very frequently. And it's critical to their safety and existence. The way the vertebrates uh, engage in color change is to move pigments around in the pigment cell, and that's what you see going on there. 
It's under neuroendocrine control, and as I mentioned, it's usually pretty slow. Before we got on here, I meant to look up color change in the mahi-mahi, also known as the dorado or the dolphin fish. You may be aware that they can undergo color change uh, from a very basic silver to beautiful iridescent rainbow colors almost instantaneously. And how they do that, I have yet to look up and resolve. Uh, it's not the way most vertebrates do it. Do you have anything that you've run across that would help us on that one, Roger? How the heck did Dorado change color so quickly? It's in part uh, has to do with oxygen concentrations. So that one of the reasons when they die, the color disappears because the, uh, the blood lymph doesn't flow anymore. The oxygen isn't uh. there, and they don't iridesce, which is actually one of the primary things. Okay. So maybe it's rapid changes in peripheral circulation yeah. that would change the oxygen tension around the pigment cells. Uh, here you see an octopus in Fiji that is beautifully camouflaged, uh, colors and patterns similar to what you see in the background, and that's quite typical. I, I don't normally go diving looking for these animals, and I'm sure because of that, I pass by many of them that are sitting right there in plain sight, but they are so well camouflaged, you just don't see them. Squids, on the other hand, being midwater animals up in the water column, uh, are doing a whole different array of things. This is a Humboldt squid. Uh, one I'll say more toward the end of the, of the uh, presentation. And very often they are countershaded, depending on where they are in the water column, dark above, so anybody above them looking down at them doesn't see them, and then light below, so that in the, the dim downwelling light coming down from above, they can also be camouflaged. They can basically disappear. Uh, there is a researcher at Hopkins Marine Station and folks at Ambari who've been looking very carefully at color and pattern in this animal. And they've documented from Ambari deep sea video out here, numerous different patterns and, and so forth. And now what they're trying to do is relate those pattern changes to behavior, depending on if there are other animals around or if they're solitary and what kinds of interactions are going on. Are they courting or not? Are they in a predation mode or not? And they've been able to put a few of those things together. But imagine if you were floating over Dodger Stadium at night in a hot air balloon and you let a camera down with a few little lights on it uh, for your first look at what's going on in Dodger Stadium. And you might see a pitcher going through various contortions or a mascot going through even more contortions. Imagine how long it would take you to put together what a baseball game is all about on that amount of information. And that's sort of where we are in deep sea research. You, you get a glimpse of what's going on within the, the uh, throw of your underwater lights. But to have a picture of what's going on in the whole life of that animal and in the entire system that it lives in, it takes a long time to put these pieces of the puzzle together. I'm going to come back to this later. This is called an ethogram, and this has been produced uh, at Ambari uh, by going through hours and hours and hours of their stock footage video from many years of taking video of Humboldt squids and other animals out here in, in this area. And again, they're just beginning to, to figure out what's going on. 
If you look in the third column to the right and the second animal down, notice that one half of it is pigmented and the other half of it is the basic white. I'll show you an example of that on an octopus from the aquarium. And Roger Hanlon has videos in his YouTube programs. And I'm going to mention Roger uh, even more later on that show other squid species doing this. I don't happen to have that one in my program. But in that one, the animal is a male courting with a female, and the pigment is on the side facing the female and is the same as her pigment. On the other side, it's warning. The rest of you guys stay away. Now, at one point in his video, the squid moves over to the other side of the female and instantaneously becomes pigmented on its right side and white on the left side. So again, it, it clearly has a significant function. And as I mentioned, they can make these changes instantaneously. We talked about grayscale. Here are red, green, blue color pigment resolution like we have in our retina. And in the gray, gray scale, if you look carefully, you can see there are different values for each of those. And one of the theories has been that these animals can see color by using the gray scale. Again, Roger Hanlon, I think, has pretty well disproved that theory. I was trying to revisit that paper yesterday, and once again, I couldn't find it. But I'm pretty sure I ran across that some time back. There's an example of grayscale. Uh, and again, uh, we see about 16 to 30 shades of gray. Other animals like cephalopods may see 200 shades of gray there. Here's the aquarium example I was uh, telling you. This is the day octopus. It's in a domed exhibit shortly after you go into the tentacles exhibit that's, that's still there, has been there a couple of years. This particular animal isn't still there. Again, these animals tend to be short-lived. But here it is, dark on the, the right side, his right side or hers, light on the other side with a straight line right down the middle. There's no other octopus in this exhibit, so it wasn't uh, displaying during a courtship procedure. But standing at the exhibit was a gentleman in a dark jacket and a lady in a white blouse next to him. And I think the octopus was displaying to those two visitors saying, well, that's fun. I can do that too. Uh, another of the theories of color vision in these critters is that in the octopus, and in this case, the cuttlefish, the pupil shape may help diffract the light in a way that they can resolve color information that way. Typically, the cuttlefishes have kind of a W-shaped or, or modified U-shaped retina, uh, I'm sorry, uh, pupil like this. And squids often go from round to a slit. And again, that may diffract the incoming light in a way that they can use that to derive color information. This is a broad club squid, uh, cuttlefish from Sulawesi. And I'll say more about this animal and show you some wonderful, I say wonderful even though I took it, the animal is wonderful. The video, uh, videographer was pretty, pretty basic. Uh, but notice not only color and pattern, but also the rough skin. Uh, Roger Luckenbach hinted at this. Roger Hanlon, H-A-N-L-O-N, and I, I named him in my resource sheet. Uh, he has more than a dozen wonderful YouTubes that are fairly short, but also a couple of much longer TED Talks on this kind of thing. And Roger Hanlon has, has been doing classified work with the Defense Department in trying to help them figure out how to 
better camouflage equipment and clothing. Uh, and they're even doing investigations into clothing that can change depending on what your background is and even get bumpy if that seems appropriate. All kinds of really wonderful things we can be learning from these animals and trying to adapt to our own uses. Now, this is another broad club cuttlefish. This is going to be a video when I push the button. Notice that the body here is rough. Notice also that he or she is unhappy when the two upper arms like that are sticking up as you see them there, that's an aggressive posture. That means, hey buddy, you're getting too close, back off. Notice something else in this picture. Notice where the eyes are. In these animals, they're not in the front of the face the way they are in us. In fact, that's rare in most of the vertebrates like birds, uh, fishes, amphibians, snakes, etc. The eyes are on the side of the head as they are here in the squids and cuttlefishes. And if you think about it, that makes really good sense. It means they can see backwards as well as forwards. And if you are a soft-bodied animal trying to make a living and avoid predation in nature, being able to look in both directions all the time certainly has real advantages to it. Now, that animal saw me and got bumpy and camouflaged, and then as you see, it changed. It's now not bumpy and it is changing the color pattern as it goes from one strip substrate to another. And I'm still bothering him or her. So pretty soon those tentacles or, or two arms are gonna come up in more of an aggressive, unhappy posture. But as he moves from one area to another, notice that sudden color change. And now he's getting a little perturbed at me. So those two, tentacles are going up. And again, another color and pattern change to blend right in perfectly with that background. I could have followed this animal all day. This was such fun, but I, I'm sure I was making him unhappy. But what I want you to notice is the rapidity with which these changes can occur. And again, now the bumpiness factor. Uh, that helps a smooth body fit in with a, a very complicated coral reef background there. Here you see an octopus in a crevice. They are typically uh, holed up during the day and they come out and do a lot of their activity and their feeding either at dawn and dusk or even at night. Being soft-bodied animals on a coral reef, they're very vulnerable to predation from sharks and other fishes. And so camouflage and holding up in a, in a cave or crevice is a very common feature. Now, something else I want you to keep in mind. Most of the, that video was, was uh, natural light and about 10 feet deep. So you saw a little bit of color there. Most underwater photographs are with an underwater strobe and they return all the color, as you see here, with great intensity to the scene. But without that strobe, this animal, based on its uh, color and pattern, would blend in beautifully, it would be very difficult to see. And this is about 60 or 70 feet deep in Fiji and there's virtually no red light, no warm colors at that depth. So you would see various shades of, of dark blue and, and gray, maybe a little bit of green at that depth. So that's something to keep in mind. The photographs you typically see of all these beautiful coral reef fishes and other underwater animals, that is not what it looks like down there. You get down 30 or 40 feet and uh, most of the red light is gone and you're seeing things in shades of, of blue and gray. 
Now, if I'm at 40 feet and I see a, a butterfly fish down there swim by, I know it is bright yellow and black. And my brain fills in the information for me. So in fact, if I took a natural light picture of that butterfly fish uh, or of this octopus, uh, the animals would be blending in quite well. Uh, and it, the fact that the butterfly fish looks brighter than it really is at that depth is something your brain is doing to fill in the information of what it's already familiar with. Here's something else that a, an octopus in this case can do. This is an octopus in Baja, California, where I've been going twice a year for over 50 years. I just did my 106th adventure to Bahia de los Angeles in Baja. This was a night dive. And this is an octopus that you would think, oh, it's just looking bumpy to break up its, its body line there. Uh, but it turns out that at night, there is an anemone that comes up out of the sand whose color and texture are exactly like that octopus. And that anemone, it turns out, is very, very venomous. Uh, in fact, during a night dive, if you turn a light on that anemone briefly, you can get video of the anemone catching little mice and shrimps and critters out of the plankton. Uh, so I'm sure that that octopus is mimicking that highly venomous anemone. And that would provide it a good deal of protection. There it is again. Something else to know about octopuses. By the way, there is of course, the debate about what is the correct plural for octopus. Is it octopi or octopuses? I had a friend at York School who taught Greek and Latin, and he said, well, it's neither of the above, it's octopodes. So there you have another way to confuse your friends and neighbors if you want to throw out octopodes instead of octopi or octopuses. Now, here we are back in Limbe Strait. Here is another example of uh, camouflage slash mimicry. This is a, an octopus called, uh, this, oh boy, brain freeze. Long, uh, long arm. One, the wonder puss. Oh, that's wonder puss. Yeah. And, that is obviously mimicry. It's mimicking the pebbly white pebble and shell fragment background there. Beautiful camouflage. Again, without the flash on the photograph here, uh, that would blend in even better. Really easy to just swim right past it. And that's what makes it possible for this very vulnerable soft body animal to be out moving around in the daytime. Here's another thing they can do. A blue ring, as in the blue ring octopus, is often a warning. This is not the blue ring octopus. Uh, this is a little octopus from Baja California with just a pair of blue rings. Uh, the blue rings are from iridophores, <laughs> in the, the chromatophores, the pigment organs of the animal. And that's a warning. Uh, typically, an animal with that kind of, a, of an advertising on it is warning you, look out, I'm either venomous or poisonous, or uh, in this case, probably both. Here is the wonderpuss again. Uh, looking a little bit different on a little, little bit lighter background, and notice its eyes up on stalks like that. So this animal can be seeing effectively in all directions uh, as compared to an animal with eyes in the front of the head like us. 
And secondly, it can move the eyes uh, almost 360 degrees. And when it turns them both in the same direction, I'm quite sure it gets 3D vision uh, very close in. And one other thing these animals can do is look like a sea snake. They can turn to black and white banding like this which is very reminiscent of one of the more common sea snakes in Indonesia, this one. And sea snakes are all highly venomous. They're among the most venomous snakes in the world. Fortunately, they are typically docile and have small mouths. And that's what saves us from getting nailed by sea snakes very often. The people who have the most trouble are fishermen taking these things out of their nets. And if you get nipped on the finger by a sea snake, you may not have long to live. Uh, fortunately, as I mentioned, they're docile. You can swim up close to them like this to take a photograph or a video, and they're not going to get worried. They know they don't have to be worried, I assume. Uh, on one dive on the island of Niue, out in the middle of nowhere in the South Pacific, we went to Niue mainly because it's known for its sea snakes. There are about a dozen species, and you see dozens of them on every dive. And at one point, my buddy, Keith Chase, who at that time was a volunteer at the aquarium, uh, I was taking a picture of something on the reef and I looked over and there was Keith pointing emphatically toward me and toward his neck. And I realized I have a sea snake wrapped around my neck <laughs> and thought, <laughs> Okay, now what do you do in a circumstance like this? You don't want the snake to get upset and bite your earlobe. That, that could be curtains. So I just very gently sort of nudged at the snake. And after a few seconds, the snake thankfully just unwound and swam away. So I can say I've had a sea snake muffler around my neck, uh, and the story ended well, fortunately. You'll see a lot more of this a little later in the program. This is the flamboyant cuttlefish. This is a shot in nature in Sulawesi, and again, without a strobe or a video light, they don't look all that flamboyant. But if you've been to the aquarium where we have them under white light, you know that they are amazingly brilliantly colored and patterned. And they also go through a, an interesting uh, thing with their pigments called the passing cloud uh, pigment pattern, where the pigments move like a passing cloud. I just ran across some information that that happens in uh, the Humboldt squid as well. In this cuttlefish, the rapidity of the pigment moving across the body, it has been shown, is very similar to the speed with which sunlight dappling ripples on the bottom move across the bottom. And so you may not think that that passing cloud is really camouflage, but it actually may be. You'll also notice with those arms raised up, this animal is not happy. It is wishing I would go away. There will be more of these coming up shortly. Ah, I forgot this is a video. So there is the aggressive posture with those two arms up in the air. Remember, these are decapods like, uh, like squids. They have 10 arms, un unlike the octopods, the octopuses that have eight. OK, just another example of brilliant color and pattern, again, probably advertising the fact that, that this is a, a venomous and or poisonous little squid. 
this is a fun story. This is an Ambari shot. The vampire squid is misnamed. It is not a vampire and it is not a squid. It is in a group of cephalopods <coughs> more or less by itself. It is a living fossil. They go way back 500 million years or so. And again, based on the occasional encountering of these animals and little by little over the years, putting the puzzle together as to how these critters really operate, uh, they finally now have a pretty good idea. Uh, again, the red coloration is camouflage where there is no red light. Red is a really good color to be. You either are basically black or you disappear. There are no sucker discs on the long arms of these animals. They are called papillae. They're tentacular. You sort of see them there. But it turns out toward the tips of the arms, there are little sucker discs. In addition, the tips of the arms are bioluminescent. They can glow in the dark. And they can release little bioluminescent particles into the water. And all of this is thought to be helpful, perhaps, in attracting prey, which are mostly small, small shrimps and fishes. It used to be thought that these were particle feeders because they have a long sticky tendril they let out. And it was thought that that's like flypaper. It catches particles out of the, the water column and then they sweep it by the mouth and that's what they're feeding on. Now they know they are micro predators. They're feeding on small shrimps and maybe larval fishes, things like that. Uh, this is, is both kind of a, a camouflage example, but also a tool use example. Uh, many octopuses pretend to be hermit crabs. And anything they can get into, including coconut shells. Uh, and by the way, coconut shells have been a part of this, this world in Indonesia, I think, only since humans have been around. So that's a fairly recent uh, adaptation, although snail shells like this uh, have been around as long or longer than the cephalopods have been around. So you see them trying to, uh, to operate like that. Now, uh, this is an example of pigment and pattern that does not change. These little animals are the striped pajama squids. This is an exhibit shot at the aquarium on what looks like volcanic sand from Limbe Strait, but this is actually an exhibit shot at the aquarium. And these are really fun little guys. They're about the size of a hen's egg or a little bit larger. And they live under the sand with just the eyes sticking up, kind of like a flatfish might. And then they are predators that burst out of the sand to grab a, a small passing fish or shrimp or crab or whatever. They are slightly venomous. So they, when they're out like this, they could be advertising that fact. But most of the time in nature, they are buried and not expressing this pattern at all. But again, unlike many of the other cephalopods, this doesn't change. They're stuck with their striped pajamas like that. OK, <clears throat> well, let's say just a little more about camouflage. This is one of my favorite animals that Ambari has documented over the years uh, out here in deep water off this coast. It's called the cockeyed squid, among other names, because it has one great big yellowish eye, as you see there, and the other eye is much smaller. And they usually are tilted a little bit, like you see this one, with the big eye looking up and the little eye looking down. 
And the idea is that the big eye is looking for prey silhouetted against the downwelling dim light from above. And the little eye is looking for bioluminescent prey that may be deeper than the animal. Again, it is red, which is really good camouflage. But something you don't see here is that it's covered with little bioluminescent dots. And so this thing can light up like a Christmas tree if it has reason to want to do that. And that would probably be during courtship and or aggressive kinds of encounters. Just one last shot of an octopus that you don't see uh, because it is so well camouflaged on that complex reef background. The octopus is just to the right of the gray coral head in the middle of the, the picture there. We've already talked about this guy. We've talked about this one. Uh, and one way to be camouflaged is to look like another animal that most smaller fishes, for instance, would leave alone. And these animals, uh, first of all, you can see the, the black and white under a couple of the arms there, the way it can mimic a sea snake. But this wonderpus can often put the arms together and the way it swims, it mimics a flat fish. And I think I have that one coming along a little bit later. This may be it. Here we go. Well, with the two arms sticking out in front there, that's not as good a flatfish as it's capable of producing. This one is more in the process of mimicking a swarm of black and white banded sea snakes and doing a very nice job of it. Again, notice how far up, how high up on stocks those eyes are. So this animal has really good 360 degree vision around it. Changes in color pattern and intensity are frequently used by these animals in signaling one another. And a lot of the work Mbari has done with the Humboldt squid is probably involves that kind of process. Now, this is the flamboyant cuttlefish at the aquarium exhibit. And you'll notice the bright colors. Again, this is with video light or, or the exhibit light. And so in nature, these critters may not look all that flamboyant, but unless they were in real shallow water. And typically where Roger and I were seeing them, they were probably in 30 or 40, maybe 50 feet of water. So the, the light wouldn't be nearly this bright. But what you'll notice here is the passing cloud pigment phenomenon. As those pigment bands move, again, very often in nature, uh, it has been found that the velocity of those movements is very similar to what the, the dappling sunlight is doing on the bottom. So it would be yet another form of camouflage. Finally, when a wonderpus gets a little bit worried, it has a burrow that it can return to. And there it is in its burrow with just the eyes sticking up to see if everything is okay. It's obviously looking at me and this monster that's blowing bubbles and making bright lights from time to time. So it decided to retreat to the burrow. I actually chased it into the burrow. Uh, but he wasn't ready to go clear down. There it is again, and we've already talked about those. All right. Uh, this gets a little bit dense, folks, and I'm going to go through it quite quickly because a lot of this is beyond my pay grade. But let's talk about what kinds of eyes and other photoreceptors these animals have. Photosensitivity is a property of nearly all living cells, from bacteria right up to plants and animals. In animals involved in critical functions, such as seasonal rhythms like migration, reproduction, cycles, hibernation, etc., 
circadian rhythms like diurnal behaviors such as sleep, feeding, reproduction, vertical migration, daily activity patterns, and vision from detecting light intensity only to directional color of light to motion and to images from blurry to sharp. So evolution has done a lot of things with photosensitivity and it's done it uh, differently in a whole lot of different groups of animals. Basic physiology of photoreception evolved once in the Precambrian, most likely uh, we think fossils aren't clear on this. The opsin is a photosensitive protein, and now there are many types of opsins. And between 50 and 100 different types of, quote, eyes, unquote, have evolved by adaptive radiation, many of them arising independently. It's a good thing to have, and so if you start to produce an eye, chances are it might get saved evolutionarily. Uh, diffuse image, uh, diffuse sensors are eye spots in unicellular animals and many types of invertebrates. Pigment spot ocelli in flatworms, echinoderms, and jellyfish. And from the eye spot in the upper left to the lensed eyes of, of cephalopods and vertebrates down below, and you see several different transitions in between. I won't dwell on this, but you can see here there are different kinds of pigment of uh, light sensing cones and rods or one or the other in all these different groups of animals. A cone on the left detects black and white in the grayscale and one way for getting, I, I'm sorry, is color and one way for getting uh, black and white in the grayscale is the rod on the right. Here is a little bit of visual physiology for you, and this is way beyond my pay scale. I haven't done this kind of thing for about 50 years, and so let's not uh, dwell on this, but you'll notice in the vertebrates and the invertebrates, it isn't all that different at a, at a glance. These are tiny little flatworms on a sea anemone in Fiji. They have eye spots so they can tell light and dark, and that's about it. Here's a little bit more ornate flatworm. These polychaete worms have eye spots on their tentacles, and they can detect not only light and dark, but they can also detect a little bit of motion. Even echinoderms have eye spots all over the body and can detect light and dark, like sea urchins and sea stars and sea cucumbers. Then we have image forming eyes. A simple eye like the box jellyfish, that's a really interesting one because they have image forming eyes, but they don't have a brain. And so what are they doing with that information? Well, they certainly can detect motion and light and dark, but what else? I'm not sure. Lots of mollusks have image forming eyes, not just cephalopods, but they're pretty good eyes in, in scallops, for instance, and some of the snails. The compound eye in arthropods and maybe in sea urchins. Uh, and probably the best eyes of all are the stomatopod eyes. They have 10,000 omatidia in each eye, 16 opsins. They see color and polarized light, and the eyes fluoresce when they're mating. They have stereoscopic vision with just one eye. Each eye is up on a stalk with a wide range of motion. Stomatopods have up to 16 visual pigments. In contrast to us, we have three. And stomatopods can also use ultraviolet and infrared light. And some even see polarized light. So here is a stomatopod 
in, um, I think, Indonesia. Uh, this species uh, has spherical eyes like that. And then this group has oblong eyes, and they are the heavy duty predators. They can grab a hold of even small fishes with those claws. Very, very successful group of predators. Uh, often hold up like this in a burrow during the day, and then they can get out and wreak havoc on small fishes and things at night. And then, of course, we have squid and octopus eyes. I mentioned that these animals probably uh, have color vision, and it may be that the color vision they have is what helps them adapt perfectly to the backgrounds that they are in. That really is kind of speculative. It hasn't really been worked out in great detail yet. But they're probably not just using black and white. They probably are able to resolve color uh, somehow in these eyes. OK, there you have an octopus on the right and a human on the left. They are really quite similar in many ways. And in many ways, since the retina does not penetrate, is not penetrated by the nerve in the octopus, uh, cephalopods can have eyesight that's even superior to us vertebrates. A little comparison of eye size among fishes and cephalopods. The size records are among the large squids. You see the black dots up in the right hand corner there. Uh, and so these, of course, have evolved quite independently. Really good eyesight. It, both the vertebrates and the cephalopods. Let's talk a little bit about behavior. Uh, this is the giant Pacific octopus, like the ones we have at the aquarium. Uh, I have not been keeping track of the time, Michelle. How are we doing? We are, Steve, about, um, about eight after 11. So we have. 20 minutes or so, um, maybe 15, if you want to allow room for questions. Well, let's try 15, and we'll leave a little time for questions. OK, this is the giant Pacific octopus. Uh, relatively short-lived, probably even though it's large, they don't live much more than two, three, at the most, four years. So we have to replace them frequently at the aquarium. Uh, and in terms of behavior, these are some of the most interesting animals at the aquarium. They typically get to know just one aquarist, and they can be quite possessive. Uh, they will interact very nicely with that one aquarist and not at all or even be aggressive and shoot water through the siphon at their less favorite aquarists. Here you see it being bumpy, trying to be camouflaged. Again, it can be very smooth, just like uh, the cuttlefish we saw in, in uh, Indonesia. Uh, the fun story of this animal and its complex intelligence comes from Steinhardt Aquarium. Other aquariums around the country have adopted this story and would have you believe it occurred there. But I know the people who were involved at Steinhardt. And here is the story. Up at Steinhardt, the Dunganess crab exhibit was 40 or 50 feet down the gallery from the octopus exhibit. And they started losing Dunganess crabs in pretty appreciable numbers. And the staff began wondering, what is going on here? And they were thinking maybe the night custodians were taking crabs home for dinner. And so the chief aquarist put a cot on the gangway uh, in the service area and was 
spending the night there to see if he could figure out anything. And along about 2 a.m., the lid lifted on the octopus exhibit, and the octopus crawled out onto the gangway, made its way right under the cot and under the nose of the aquarist on the cot to the Dunganess crab exhibit opened the lid, got in, grabbed a crab, came out, closed the lid, back under the cot, back into the octopus exhibit, closed the lid. Well, the reason they hadn't suspected the octopus is that it had been hiding all of the crab exoskeletons underneath the artificial rock work in the exhibit, which was hollow. And so that explained how the crabs were disappearing. It wasn't the night custodian, it was the octopus. Now, think about what that tells you about octopus intelligence. Great spatial sense, great inquisitiveness. It had to wander down there at some time just to figure out that, oh boy, there are crab dinners here. And maybe it went in that direction because it picked up some scent from the water bubbling in the crab exhibit. But in order to do that, it would probably have to be outside its own exhibit. In fact, it certainly would. So that would suggest that this animal was out wandering around at night exploring, always with a good compass sense and able to get back safely uh, before morning came, so it wouldn't be discovered. We've had octopuses at the Monterey Bay Aquarium that have taken similar uh, excursions around, usually found in the morning when the aquarists come in to do their work. Uh, and typically, octopus exhibits are surrounded these days by astroturf, which they do not like to cross. Uh, it used to be burlap in the old days, but burlap rots and was a mess. So AstroTurf has been a savior. Now, the giant Pacific octopus has that range, widely ranging, and it's today the largest octopus in the world. I think the record is 26 feet tip to tip. And even at that, they tend not to live more than three or four years. And like most cephalopods, well, most octopuses at least, they reproduce once. The females guard the eggs until they hatch, and then they die. Uh, another octopus intelligence story here, adopting a half a coconut shell. And this octopus actually carries the shell around with it. And anytime it feels threatened or wants to protect itself, it just pulls the, the coconut shell up over it. And in fact, there are octopuses that have a whole shell midden that they carry around with them and can literally cover the body with molluscan shells as protection against sharks and moray eels. One of the resources I'd like to recommend to you is my octopus teacher. It is about an hour long film made by a very skilled free diver in South Africa, uh, dives without a wetsuit in water just as cold as ours here or even colder. And he documented for almost a year the daily activities of a single octopus. Uh, the film is a little bit heavy on why this guy had a year to spend on doing this because he was uh, depressed about his job. But if you can get past that and dwell on the beautiful footage and the octopus behavior, I recommend this to you. It is my octopus teacher. It's on both YouTube and Netflix. And one thing you will see is the octopus getting attacked by a pajama shark, a small shark that lives within its territory. And 
And at one point, the octopus covered with shells is getting jerked around and rolled around and carried around by the shark, but not injured because the octopus has covered itself with these shells. And then at another point, you see the octopus has climbed onto the back of the shark right behind its head. And the shark is swimming around looking puzzled and unable to figure out how to get rid of this octopus that attached itself. Uh, wonderful footage, and I recommend it highly to you. But again, it tells you a whole lot about octopus behavior, ingenuity, planning, thinking ahead, etc. And it during the end of this uh, nine month long interaction with the diver, uh, they became fast friends and the octopus was snuggling up to this fellow in ways you would never expect an octopus to do. Let's talk first of all about predators of octopuses and other cephalopods. This is the stomatopod, the mantis shrimp. They are powerful, very effective predators. Those with spherical eyes, as you see here, are percussionists. They actually create a percussive bang in the water by removing two plates on their claws so rapidly that the water cavitates. And when the water then fills the gap, it creates a percussive bang that can stun their prey. Uh, here is a very effective predator, the flamboyant cuttlefish. It's obviously not camouflaging itself. So what does it do? Well, like other decapods, it has two long tentacles that it can shoot out and pull back with amazing speed. And keep in mind, these do not have bony skeletons and muscles working in opposition to one another. Each of these tentacles is like a water balloon with longitudinal muscles and circular muscles. And it's all under nervous control. And you're going to see in a moment here, this is a video from the flamboyant cuttlefish exhibit at the aquarium. Now, don't blink or you're going to miss it. The cuttlefish on the left has a very transparent little shrimp that it's going to go after right at the right hand edge of the picture. And watch how these feeding tentacles work. There's the shrimp. Here comes a tentacle. Pow! Is that remarkable? And how do you do that using the physics of a water balloon with circular and longitudinal muscle? Unbelievable. Now, it was thought initially by folks at Mbari, I think I have this correctly, that the vampire squid which again is not a squid and it's not a vampire, fed with that long sticky tendril that's sticking out there, using it like flypaper. It was thought they were particle feeders. Well, more recent information indicates they can actually throw that umbrella uh, between the arms around a, a small shrimp or, or larval fish and then move the prey up to the mouth with those tendrils, uh, even though they don't have sucker discs on them. And if you go on Anbari's website and click on products, then on videos, then on cephalopods, and this I enumerate in my resource sheet that I hope, I think you all have, uh, they will show you footage of these animals both feeding and getting into what's called the pineapple posture, where the whole body and the eyes are hidden within this webbing, and it looks for all the world like a pineapple. So they can disguise themselves very well if something dangerous is lurking nearby. 
Here you see an octopus with its favorite shells that it carries around with it, similar to what I described from the My Octopus Teacher program. Now, predators of these animals, big fish like sea basses, moray eels, big crabs, and little crabs and shrimps are predated by these animals. And why don't we end there with memory? And if we have a little bit of time next week, uh, I know Roger has a good deal of material he'd like to share with you next week. And I'd like to share a little bit more on the Humboldt squid, since a lot of that work is being done right here in Monterey Bay and with local animals.